Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season, we're dealing with a few issues through reflection and examination of the scriptures. This time, what lessons can we take away from the sword of St. Peter? The original sword, carried and used by St. Peter during his time with Jesus and the Apostles, is believed to be located in a museum in Poland right now, but our study of this sword will be based mainly on what's said about it in the Bible. There aren't many verses that make reference to the sword, but there are many different interpretations of those verses. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear, and the name of the servant was Malchus. John 18.10 By the time that Jesus was arrested by the priests and Pharisees, Peter already had a sword which he kept in a sheath. In this verse, Peter draws his sword and attacks a man named Malchus with it, who was working for the high priest. Because this happened almost immediately after Jesus talked to his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, we know that Jesus was aware of Peter's sword. In fact, Jesus himself, at the Last Supper not long before this, suggested that his disciples should go armed. But they said, Nothing. Then he said unto them, But now he that hath a purse, let him take it, and he likewise a scrip, and he that hath not, let him sell his coat and buy a sword. Luke twenty two thirty six. Because this command is given so soon before the arrest of Jesus, we can suppose that Peter had his sword when the Last Supper took place as well. At the least, we know some of the disciples already had swords because of what followed after Jesus gave that command. But they said, Lord, behold, here there are two swords. And he said to them, It is enough. Luke 22, 38. Two of the disciples were armed already when Jesus told them that they needed to buy a sword. One of those was most likely Peter, and Jesus says that that's good enough. Now, some Bibles include a footnote suggesting that Jesus' reply to them, it is enough, was actually a statement of exasperation, that they didn't understand what he really meant when telling them to buy a sword. I don't think so, however, because there are other points in the Bible where Jesus expresses exasperation with his apostles for not understanding what he means, and things play out differently there, to give just one example. Who said to them, Take heed, and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. But they thought within themselves, saying, Because we have taken no bread. And Jesus, knowing it, said, Why do you think within yourselves, O ye of little faith, for that you have no bread? Matthew sixteen six to 8 The disciples took Jesus literally when he mentioned the leaven of the Pharisees and assumed he was talking about bread. But that's not what he meant, and he made sure to tell them so. Why do you not understand? But it was not concerning the bread I said to you, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he said not that they should beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Matthew sixteen eleven to 12 When a misunderstanding arose, Jesus clarified his position to make it clearer to the disciples. Jesus frequently does this when the disciples fail to understand his words. However, in the verse about the two swords, Jesus offers no clarification at all, and doesn't even say that the disciples have misunderstood him. So I don't think it's likely that Jesus meant anything more than what he said in this case, that two swords were enough for a group of twelve apostles. The very fact that Jesus said this reveals something else about how the swords were meant to be used. We know that the plan was not for the disciples to go to war with anyone. Two swords among twelve people would not win any wars, especially considering that your typical Roman legionary of the time was armed with a sword, a spear, a shield, and several lead throwing darts, so the swords weren't meant to be used for war. We can further narrow down the likely purpose of the sword by examining Jesus' reaction when Peter uses it. Then Jesus saith to him, Put up again thy sword into its place, for all that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Matthew 26.52 Remember, Jesus knew that Peter had a sword with him, and he was satisfied with that. So when he says, take the sword, he's not referring to carrying a sword or picking one up. This use of the word, take, seems to imply a deliberate choice to use a sword against your fellow man, in the same way that a person can take sides. The path of violence necessarily involves risking your life, as Jesus says, unless, of course, those doing the fighting are incapable of death. 
Thinkest thou that I cannot ask my father, and he will give me presently more than twelve legions of angels? Matthew twenty six fifty three. If God wanted to accomplish a task by force, he could do so quickly and efficiently by placing that task into the hands of the army of preternatural, undying warriors who are always ready to serve him. This is one reason why it's not generally necessary for Christians to use physical force in support of God. But Jesus answering said, Suffer ye thus far, and when he had touched his ear, he healed him. Luke twenty-two fifty-one. Jesus then repairs the damage done in Peter's attack. So, what does this say about the purpose of Peter's sword? The sword wasn't meant to be used to disrupt the community, to kill people, or even to cause simple injuries. It was, according to Jesus, meant to be kept in its place, the sheath. But if so, why even bother buying a sword at all? The answer is that swords have another use, beyond winning wars, killing, and injuring people. If a merchant brings his cart down the road to Jerusalem, there's a chance he might get ambushed by robbers and all his goods would be stolen. The same is true of groups or teams of merchants. A group of twelve unarmed merchants all traveling together can be robbed almost as easily as just one. However, what happens when some of the people in that group are armed? Suddenly, the robbers lying in wait by the side of the road, eager to ambush and steal, spot the weapons being carried by the travelers and think to themselves, there are more of us than of them, but they're armed. We could probably beat them and take their things, but there's also the chance one of us could die in the battle. Better to wait for a safer mark, someone who can't defend themselves. Many people see a deadly weapon and think only about its potential for death. But deadly weapons also have great potential for peace. If a weapon is being visibly carried by a normal person, it can prevent conflicts and injustices from happening without even being used simply because the evildoer runs, or believes he runs, a greater risk in attacking an armed group than an unarmed one. When Jesus tells his disciples to arm themselves, he is not telling them to use those arms for killing, or injuring, or even to use them at all. A pacifist carrying a sword looks just as threatening as a trained warrior to the robber, predator, or thug on the street, and is just as much of a reason not to commit crimes against that person or anyone they're protecting. In this way, the mere possession of weapons can help foster an atmosphere of peace, whether people have any intention to use those weapons or not. I think that this is the purpose of the sword of St. Peter. It's not meant to be a sword of violence, but a sword of peace. Next, what does the Bible have to say about doctors and medicine? That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.